Goed, ons gaan nou na ons volgende onderwerp kyk wat dier Dr. Maakreitser gehanteer gaan word. Die titel daarvan is Biblical Eschatology of Cultural Hope. Ek dink dat hierdie onderwerp is geweldig belangrijk, omdat dit vir ons as christene um, kan help om meer productief te kan arbeid. Ek dink die um, eschatologie beteken die, hoe, hoe jy die laaste um, dinge, hoe jy daar oor dink, en ek dink op die oomlik die meeste christene, christene in die wereld, sy denke is geweldig negatief in termen van eschatologie en dit veroorzaak dat uh, christene nie so productief is nie. Ek kan bijvoorbeeld, ek kan een voorbeeld noem, jare gelede toe ek die tweede Bijbelse wereldbeskouwing seminar georganiseer het, nou jylle kan dink so seminar Dit is nogal baie moeite wat een mens moet inzet. Als jij niet zes maanden voor die tijd begin organiseren, nie, dan moet je dit maar ieder los. En ek het daai seminar begin organiseren en ek gaan keier toe by iemand, en um, hy, is a, hy, hy is a baie toegeweide christen, wat dinge doen, hy, hy neem deel aan opmarsen tegen abortie en allerhande dinge, en um, hy vraag my, wat doen ek? Ek sê nie, ek is bezig om een bybelse wereldbeskind seminar te reel. Hy vraag wanneer, ek sê nie, eers oor vijf maanden. Hy kyk my so, hy sê, weet jy, jy moors jou tyd. Ek is toe bykie verbaas, hy sê vir my, want oor vijf maanden het Jesus al lang al gekom. <laughs> nou dit is twintig jaar later en dit was toen nie die einde nie. So die probleem is, die denken veroorzaak dat jy nie langtermijn beplan nie, jy doen nie langtermijn beleggings nie, Jy gaan nie Grieks en Hebrews leer om, om beter te kan werk nie. Dit is, dit is waarvan ek praat, dat ons um, denker rond, rondom die laaste dag is geweldig belangrijk. Baie dankie maak dat jy bereid is om met ons hier oor te praat. Baie dankie. Is dit, werk dit nou? Kan jy dit hoor? Oké, okay, goed. <coughs> Alright. Ek Het begin, um, ach, ek sal my oorskakel na Amerika. Um, I began thinking about eschatology after reading a book <coughs> in the 1970s called The Late Great Planet Earth. Not one of the predictions has ever come true. And I began to think, why? Because it's wrong um, exegesis, wrong theology, and it gives no hope. So I studied uh, Sendungwietenskap, um, missiology, because I thought we must um, reach the world before 1988. <coughs> because that's how they figured it out. 40 years from ni- uh, um, 1948, Israel was uh, reborn as a nation, and 40 years later is 1988. <coughs> so 1988... Um, came, and there was a book out, uh, I still have it, called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come Back in 88. The next year, he comes out with 89 reasons why he will come back in 89. <coughs> Didn't happen. Well, I began, to th- I began to study more Reformed theology. <clears throat> that was one of the things that began to give me a, a strong change in my thinking. If it's from God, certainly it will come true. <clears throat> so I began to, in South Africa, at St. James Kenilworth, there was a book table. And the old uh, Dar, um, his name was Ron Fersfeld. And he's, I think he changed his name to Ron Grace. He, he works in Johannesburg. Jylle moet hom leer ken. Sy eind, oudelike ou. He had a book table, and I began to read and read and read, <coughs> and I said, whew, I think I, I need to have a complete paradigm shift in how I think. Um, and that opened up a whole new world of biblical thinking. <coughs> At the same time, the Lord gave me a, a new... Um, a new um, view for covenant and a new view of uh, um, 
the doctrine of salvation. And God gave me a whole paradigm shift right here in South Africa, down first in Cape Town and then in Pretoria. And then Dominic Christio Don uh, saw that <coughs> through the writings that I was doing. In fact, Serkos of Dice Stadium was on precisely self destroyed from dual, but uh, Paktum Institute had. So we, um, except for we tried to do it on a more popular level. And I began to have a change in how to interpret prophetic literature. <clears throat> so let me just pray and open up. Father, we thank you that you're the God of insight. Just like Daniel said, he prayed, and Lord, you gave him wisdom on how to interpret the, um, the king of Babylon's dreams. Father, open up um, our, our spiritual eyes. Blow away the fog and let us see a paradigm shift to give us long-term cultural hope. And we ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so I, I began to have a shift in how I interpreted the, the prophetic and apocalyptic literature. Now, apocalyptic is a book like um, Zechariah and the book of Revelation, where there's many symbols and there are many um, very mysterious things that you have to compare scripture with scripture throughout the whole, you have to have a broad knowledge of scripture to be under, understand these symbols. And um, we, we began, I began to see that um, the Lord himself interprets these more uh, uh, um, dark passages with the clear prophetic statements. So clear must always interpret the unclear um, especially in the book of Revelation. So, for, for example, in John 5, Jesus says there's only one resurrection from the dead, not two. There's not going to be a rapture, and then seven years of tribulation, and then another resurrection, and then at the end of a thousand years, there's going to be another resurrection. Jesus says there's just one resurrection. He says, I myself will call the dead out of the grave. Boom. Now, we believe in the rapture. This is the Vechrapung. But God has to interpret when it happens, not man's ideologies put upon the scripture. We have to let the clear passages interpret the less clear. And so Paul's clear passages must judge the less clear passages of Revelation as well. So Romans 4, he talks about the Abrahamic covenant. We're going to talk about that. In your seed, Abraham, your child, Will all the mishpahot, all the families of the earth, be blessed? And then he says later on in the a version of it, all the um, uh, um, goyim, all of the idol-worshipping folk grupa, the, the na uh, ethno, I, 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 I term it ethno-nations. So he has to interpret, the clear must interpret the less clear. And then John gives us very clear time indicators in Revelation 1 and Revelation 22. He says, in this clear section, it's like a, a sandwich. The meat is in the middle. He gives you clear time indicators. It will come soon. And then he ends up the book, Behold, I am coming soon. And when you begin to see the clear must interpret the, the apocalyptic symbolic section in the middle, it opens your eyes to see what, what happens. So here's our eight summary principles. Okay. Our Lord is king over all. I think that's one of the basic messages, starting with Genesis 1. Our Lord sits on the throne and speaks. And it comes to pass. Now, John interprets that. Who is the one who speaks? God, the Father. Who is the Word? Jesus. And the power of the uh, Spirit is, is, um, uh, is energizing the Word through the Father. So this, it's a, it's a uh, Trinitarian beginning. And he sits as king over all, and he's in control of all because he's the owner of all. And that must set our, um, our eschatology, our view of the last days. So then after the fall, Satan becomes 
the God of this age. Yet, who still rules? God through Christ by the Spirit. Now, Satan is not more powerful than God. You know, so many p- times that people say, ach, this is not the devils of battle. Lost it. You know, it's, it's just the devil's world. No, it, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Psalm 1, I mean Psalm 24, verse 1. And Paul repeats that in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So, third, <coughs> this line from creation fall began immediately after the fall with the prediction of a coming uh, victor who will crush the head of Satan. And so the, the promise that there's going to become a victor who later is revealed more and more that he's going to be a king and yet at the same time human and God. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. He says, a son will be given to us, a child will, will come, and his name will be, does anybody know the, the, the names that he gives? Yeah, uh, a eternal um, king, um, everlasting father, which in, the, in that culture meant that he would be the father of his people, and um, a, uh, um, prince of peace, Wonderful Counselor. All of those are divine names. God Almighty, the Almighty God. He's both God and man. And as we see, this promised kingdom finally comes in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. But it's not yet perfect. But one aspect that's missing that gives us hope is that his kingdom reign is growing mightily upon the earth and will, and I'm going to show this, hopefully if we have time, disciple every folk group, folkera, elke folk group upon the earth. He will disciple. He gives us the, the, the great commission, the grut optach. And here's what he says. Go, literally, go disciple all the people. He doesn't say make disciples Fun the folkera, or f- uh, make disciples of the peoples. He says, disciple every people group. Pantata ethne in Greeks, in kolal mishpaot in in Hebrew. So it's growing upon the earth, and God in Christ works especially through the body to do that, because she's His bride. Six Christ desires all peoples to be desi- uh, to be discipled. That's His. His desire, he says that, he desires all mankind to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We'll see that. Seven, all people groups will be like yeast in their culture so that the whole of the culture, every culture group and every language group will be completely yeasted, leavened in English with the wisdom of, that Christ gives, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded them. And then eight, Only at the second coming, when he speaks the word of command and people come out of the grave, will there be perfection. He will create a a new heavens and a new earth that's completely uh, finished. So where where do I stand? Some people say, where do you stand, professor? They ask me all the time. And I say, I'm somewhere in the middle. But notice, I'm further down towards historic uh, post-millennialism now, historic post-millennialism believe that Christ is going to disciple all the peoples and then there's going to be a literal thousand years of a golden age upon the earth. Now, I've decided I don't think that's what the scripture teaches. Premillennialism says Jesus is not yet reigning. He will only come back when um, every people group has got a, at least a few believers in it. And then he will set up a kingdom and force everybody else to become his follower. It's it's conversion by the sword. But remember when Jesus is pictured on the white horse with his angels? Where is the sword? 
from his mouth, the word of God. So there, is a, there are some things in the premillennials. I mean, we should read the premillennial perspective because I believe that God is a whole body and he brings us all together and we should read all three sides <coughs> and f- take that which is biblical and build upon it. Now, <coughs> all millennialism, they're very idealistic. They see principles of Christ's reign from the book of Revelation. And there's a lot of truth to it. So I call myself a, <coughs> a premillennial I, a millennialist, or a, I mean a, pre, a postmillennial amillennialist, or an optimistic amillennialist, or a neo postmillennialist. You notice it's, it's kind of both ends. You, you have to see that there is a lot of truth about the fact that the book of Revelation has principles. Jesus is the king. He's coming. He's attacking um, Babylon and things like that. <clears throat> but does the term a thousand always literally mean a thousand? Does God own only the cattle on 1,000 hills and on a thousand in first hill and a thousand second hill he doesn't own it? What does he mean he owns the cattle on a thousand hills? The Hebrew language uses a thousand as a large uncountable number. (coughs) And you can see that all throughout the Old Testament and in the book of Revelation. So I've really understood Augustine's, uh, Augustine's perspective. Jesus reigns now, and he reigns between the resurrection until the second coming. The post-millennial vision is that that kingdom is growing. Okay, there's ups and downs of the kingdom, but if you trace it out, it's going up like that. It's beginning to go up straight. The doubling rate is halving every five years or so. And so when it begins to go like that, for the first time in history, God is moving among the Muslims and among the Hindus in a powerful way. We're in... And our children and grandchildren's generation, you're going to see the greatest turning to Christ that's ever been seen if, they, if that keeps going like that. So now, there are key passages that we must understand. <clears throat> First, it's, it, we, we need to begin with the creation and um, the Tower of Babel. Don't have time to explain the whole thing. This is like a whole semester's lecture in one 45-minute time. But God created the heavens and the earth, and then he created humanity, male and female, and he created them as a family. It's the basic building block of culture. (coughs) But they rebelled against God, and so God brought death. And so you see death enter the world. And, with, and sin reigned in death, Paul says in Romans 5. And he destroyed them, except for one family again. Notice family is the, is the key idea, the household theme, the family theme. And from there, the very uh, next chapter after the, 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 uh, the next chapters after the, um, the flood and the destruction and the rebuilding of the human race and the rebuilding of a new of a, in, a, in a symbolic form, a new heavens and a new earth, humanity rebelled again. <clears throat> so what does God do? He fast forwards the already inbuilt creational process and gave each clan, each family group, a language. So it wasn't, you know, Slabot Kray Atal, in Tina Kraya Andertal, and Alakhani and Andra Rachtaga, near the Elka family Kraya Tal. So uh, there wasn't enough people to build the tower, so what happened? They were scattered. Well, wasn't that what God's command was in the beginning? Be fruitful, multiply, scatter, and fill the earth. In fact, they said, We don't want to scatter, lest we be scattered over the whole earth. So he scatters them with different languages. Now, what does the next chapter say? God called Abraham's family. And um, you can see the Abrahamic covenant (coughs) throughout the the scriptures, so we'll see that more. 
Then in the Psalms, he picks up on this Abrahamic covenant over and over again. And he, he gives predictions that the whole earth and all of its families and all of its clans and all of its peoples will turn to the Lord. The prophets pick that up. The Gospels repeat it. Paul's letters show it. And the Revelation shows it. So those are your key passages. Once you get these six key passages <coughs> and use those principles, the clear must interpret the less clear, <coughs> you can build a sound biblical theology of the last days. Now, by the way, when did the last days start? Okay, his first coming begins the process of the last days. Peter specifically says on the day of Pentecost, this should be fulfilled. Um, this what you see in here is the fulfillment in the last days of God's prediction in Joel. And then Hebrews 1 verse 1, he says, in the last days God has given us his final revelation in the word which, he's, which he uh, sent in the person of Jesus. So the last days clearly begins with Pentecost and many theologians say with actually with the incarnation of Jesus, that's the beginning of the last days. And as I s saw last time, <clears throat> after the fall of Adam, all of life was destined to fail. Why? Because God wanted to show there's only one good man who is also God. All of history comes down to failure, but Jesus is the only one who is the savior, the victor. But from there, the spirit is outpoured. He gives us the, gr uh, the great commission, the chrut optach, and he sends us out in the power of the spirit, and you can see how God is beginning to reach all the peoples until the end. So it's an hourglass view of history. <clears throat> so notice that the expression, then a thousand, you can see it in, Psalm 50, 10, where it talks about the cattle on a thousand hills. Isaiah 30, 17, and Revelation 20. All of these have a th the word a thousand, but it's used symbolically, except for when the contest ex is extremely clear, like 1,000 troops went out and marched against the Philistines. Now, that doesn't mean an uncountable large number, I think, in that context, but many contexts, he uses it in a symbolic way. So let's just <coughs> look at number one. Um, the Lord is covenant king over the whole universe, so his commission is to exercise dominion. That's called the cultural mandate. Now what was the cultural mandate? Be fruitful, multiply. Mar, reign over the earth not as kings. We're not created to be kings. What are we created to be? Well, governors. There's a groot verschil tussen a koning and a gouverneur. The king makes the rules. He judges, and um, he makes the, uh, he's the lawmaker, judge, and king. The executive, legislative, and the, um, what is it in America? The legislative, executive, and judicial. He's all three in himself. That's why the American fathers divided the government into three branches. Because man cannot do any of those by himself. Only King Jesus gives the wisdom for each branch. Only Jesus is all three. We're not created to be kings, judges, and, and um, um, executors. So this was part of that original covenant of law that God gave to humanity. But before humanity sinned, the covenant of law was a good thing because the Holy Spirit was in them. When God breathed into Adam, he breathed the Spirit of God into them. They, Kuiper is very clear if you read his uh, Doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And i am become very convinced of what uh, Kuiper's argument that humanity was created with the Holy Spirit, shining out the glory of God. What happened when <coughs> Eve gave Adam that apple or whatever the fruit was? The glory left and the Holy Spirit left. 
That's why it says devoid that people without Christ are without the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus can come back and give the Holy Spirit. He did it symbolically in the upper room. What does he do? He enters into the room. Peace be uh, uh, to you. Then he breathed on them, and what did he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. He was showing that he was the one who breathed the Spirit into the mouth of Adam. I think that it was symbolic. He's the creator who breathed the, the Spirit. He says, you are now the new man, the new, well, men and women collective, the new man. He symbolically breathes the Holy Spirit upon them, and he says, now wait for 10 uh, for 40 days until the day of Pentecost. He was with them. And then he says, wait, when the Holy Spirit comes, then you will receive power to what? Deci- to go out and bear witness and disciple the nation. So that was good. <clears throat> the legal covenant was good. They failed. Now here's the difference between then and now. Adam, if he had kept the law perfectly, God would have said, okay, You've passed your probation time. I will declare you righteous and I will make you unable to sin. Now what happens now with us under grace? Jesus does it for us. He obeys the laws perfectly. God declared him righteous when he raised him from the dead because if he was not righteous, he would have remained in the grave. (coughs) And we, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, are joined to Christ. We're going to talk about that in the next hour. We die with him, we're raised up with him, and we're seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ. And we have the very power of the resurrected spirit of Christ within us. And now he says, now go. You've already been justified because Jesus did it for you. You've already been accepted, adopted back into the family. And you can never lose it because Jesus has the power of eternal life within himself. Now go, disciple the nations. And what's the promise? I am with you always until it's accomplished, until the end of the age. It's beautiful. So it's mandatory that every human individual hear the gospel, but in the end, that every People, tribe, language, and nation will be converted. Now, that's what my thesis is. There's many passages. Um, Genesis 10 and 11 talks about the creation of the peoples. Daniel 3, 4, and 7 talks about all people's tongues and tribes and nations. Revelation 7, 11, 13, and 14 talk about that. It's a theme throughout the scripture. All people's tongues, tribes, and nations. And God gives royal authority symbolically to the Davidic king. Then when the Davidic kings ended, he gives it to, to the Nebuchadnezzar and his line. Then he gives it to that power over old tribes, tongues, and nations, to the Medes and Persians. I was in Media, Kurdistan, just a, a few weeks ago. And then he gives it to the Greeks. Then he gives it to the Romans. And in the days of the Roman kings, a rock comes and smashes the, the kingdoms of, of earth and the Kingdoms of, of earth become, again, under a Jewish king of the line of David. and He's the king of all the earth. And now he says, it all belongs to me. Go disciple them. All authority in heaven and earth belongs to me. Go disciple all the nations. It's, it's again, beautiful. So after the fall, Satan was a rival prince, <clears throat> yet his dark domain... Paul uses a different word. It's it's not um, uh, um, kingdom. He uses the word like for authority, his dark domain of authority. Um, God gave him the right to rule all the nations and peoples and tongues um, because he usurped the, um, the rule of Adam. But who was still the ruler over all? God in Christ by the Spirit. He ruled over. How do we know that? Book of Job. Did, did God give um, Satan permission to test Adam? I mean, to test Job? 
Yes. <clears throat> God reigned. It probably was Christ. And here's the reason why. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the angel said, holy, 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 who did he see? It says it in John 12, verse 48. He saw Jesus. That was the pre-incarnate Christ. Probably any time you ever see uh, a, a manifestation of, of God, it's always the pre-incarnate Christ or the, the incarnate Christ, either on earth or in his resurrected form now. So our goal is to rob as many of his people out of the dark domain and bring them into the kingdom so that the kingdom reign grows larger and larger and larger and the dark domain grows smaller and smaller. How do we know that? Remember the parable? They said, you, are, you do that by casting out demons by Beelzebub, by the, by the, ach, man, toch. So nooit hier klaar vir jy. He says, they said, you, cast out demons by what? Beelzebub. He said, no. I destroy the kingdom of Satan. I go in as a stronger soldier. The guy has his, you know, his AK-47, but Jesus goes in with, you know, lightsabers out of his, you know, I don't know, you know, I mean, he's a superhero. He comes in, binds him up, and what does he do? He robs his house. That's what he's doing. He's bound Satan at the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. He bound Satan in his ministry, his cross and his resurrection, in his present reign. And now we are working with him to um, rob his, Satan's people with the gospel proclamation and bring them into the kingdom of Christ so it'll grow. We want to not just bring individuals, but we want to bring whole families. There's a whole family theme throughout the scripture. That's why they baptized whole family groups in the book of Acts. <clears throat> but the authority over even Satan always belongs to the Lord because the earth is the Lord in the fullness. So the promised kingdom of God <clears throat> was promised through Abraham and gives five times he gives the um, uh, the promise um, three times to Abraham once to uh, Isaac and twice uh, no once to Jacob and then once again to <clears throat> Judah in the 49th chapter 49 verse 10 Genesis 49 verse 10 he says that uh, the king will come and um, tribute will be belong to him and to him belongs the obedience of all the goyim, all the nations, the ethnic nations of the earth. So he gives it five times, this promise of the Abrahamic covenant. He repeats it over and over again in the prophets and in the, in the Psalms. And when Jesus um, <coughs> allows there to be an earthly king, God didn't want them to have an earthly king. That's why we're, we're um, the um, Transvaal Republic. We have no king but Jesus and no bishop but Jesus. It says it in the, in, the, in the New Testament. He is the, the bishop and the apostle of our souls. So we don't need any bishops and we don't need any kings. Jesus is that. And he's come <coughs> as a fulfillment. God al al allowed it to be a, a, a temporary picture of that kingship to be given to David in his line. But it was always promise, promise, promise. But when Jesus comes, he says, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, <coughs> and the only other time the, fing the word finger of God is used is when God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger. If I cast out demons with the finger of God, what has come? The kingdom of God has already come upon you. 
John the Baptist announced it, and there's a, uh, there's a deliberate ambiguity in the Greek. Egus could mean um, it has come near, or in some contexts, it has already come. John the Baptist says the kingdom is very near. Repent. What does Jesus say? The exact same terms. The kingdom has come already. And if I cast out demons with the finger of God, the kingdom of God has already come upon you. Don't look around and say, oh, the kingdom is over here. The kingdom." He says, no, the kingdom is right here among you. Why? I'm here. But you don't recognize me. Of course, it's not going to come perfectly until the second coming, but it must grow upon the earth. So how does God work? He works through both his visible body, that's the the sechbara chamientas, but especially in the invisible body, as we go and be salt and light. And I think it was um, Ari that talked about the invisible uh, or the Salt and light. Who was it? I can't remember. Was it Slobby? One of the lectures talked about salt and light. We're to be salt and light. How? Well, we're to preserve that which is good, and then we're <coughs> through saltness, and we're to be light. What is light? Well, if I turn off all of these lights, what's going to happen? Totally black. And when the light comes into the room, what happens to the darkness? It's gone. That's what we're supposed to do. Go into the darkness of the surrounding townships. And the Afrikaner was one of the ones. And there's, I was talking with Hendrik Furwut. He said, Pa was a sendalan. Well, I don't want to go there, but I mean, okay, they said the Afrikaner has no mission vision. That's not true. The, the, one of the greatest turnings to Christ in Nigeria was a clump bura sendelinga in Nigeria under the Tif people. And as it got more and more politically incorrect for Afrikaners to be, they turned it over to the, to the um, Christian Reformed Church in, in America to, to, to help that movement. But the Afrikaners have been a missionary people. The vision was that we won't just be a light here in Hiriland, but to, to be a light to the nations. <clears throat> and so we're to pray and to work for the growth of the kingdom. And that's what li- uh, salt and light is. That's how God works. So his kingdom is growing upon the earth and will disciple. Now, how do we know this? Well, <clears throat> let's look at some of the parables. He says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Does the mustard seed say, stay tiny? The smallest of all the the garden seeds. Does it say tiny? No, it grows into a huge bush. A huge, they say it grows up sometimes up to to 12, 3 meters. Tiny little seed grows up and the birds come. Well, that's a picture from the book of Daniel of the growth of the kingdom. And all the birds are like the Gentile nations, all of the, the goyim come and nest in it. That's the picture of the kingdom. As God's kingdom grows, he brings all of the birds into the kingdom. That's the nations surrounding. What what happens when the woman comes and takes a tiny little bit of yeast, puts it into the dough? What happens to the dough? So all this, no. What is the word in Afrikaans for to leaven? Reich? Rice. It rises, yeah. The, the, we, the, the, the whole bread rises and it goes through the whole of the kingdom. We're to not only um, let the, all of the nations come into the kingdom, but we're to, to spread the gospel commission. He says, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded to the ends of the earth. So into visible manifestations in every area of life so that the kingdom of God is just as true. He says the kingdom of God is also, uh, the kingdom of God is need, not eating or drinking, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the spirit. Righteousness is We We need to teach all of what it means to be right with God, but also how to live out that righteousness into all areas of life. Romans 14, verse 17. Now, Christ clearly says he desires all peoples of mankind to to be saved. Well, let's look at this one. We'll read this one. First Timothy 
two one day I shall a Bible of your a machine head you can end it okay I shall a big exercise do if you are a Western individualist you look at this as all individuals but if you're a Jew the Jew saw the world as us the um, das Volk Gottes of, uh, um, of Deutsch. We are the people of God, and all the surrounding idol worshiping peoples are the nations, the Goyim. So it's always our people and all the other people surrounding them. That's called um, in, in um, Greek cosmos, the world. The world is not just earth, physical thing. He's talking about the human world. The human world is all of the tongues, tribes, and nations. We'll see this in this context. First Timothy um, chapter 2, verse 1 to 8. So let me read this, and I'll do a little exegesis. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. See the individualism there. It says, for all mankind. It should be translated, all mankind. Well, how do we know? Well, you'll see it from the context. Not every single individual. You can't pray for every individual, but you can pray for people groups. And as the body of Christ begins to pray, God moves. Now, why? Well, there's a mystery. He says, you have not because you ask not. Can we change God's decree? No. But God puts it upon his people's heart to pray in the Spirit and then God answers the prayers that he puts upon our hearts to pray. It's kind of a, a secret mystery. But if you don't ever ask God, he's not going to give it to you. So I said, pray for them. Pray for the kings. Wie ist die Kunning von Südafrika? No. What is his name? Ramaphosa? Okay. Yeah, I forget all of the first and the ones. Well, okay, Cyril Ramaphosa. Pray for him. That he would repent and be saved and rule with justice. Or, if he doesn't, what does Psalm 2 say? He will be destroyed in his way. It's, uh, uh, the people of God pray for his, his salvation. It, but if not, that he will be destroyed in his way. Psalm 2, it says it. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry in you, kings and rulers, be destroyed in your way. But how blessed are those who take refuge in him. Kings and princes need to turn, and we need to proclaim the gospel. God may call some of you. Peter Hammond went into Nelson Mandela's office and said he must turn and repent. I don't know why they haven't killed him. And then he says, um, he says, for kings and for all those in authority that they may, that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and holiness. What? So that we can make our children holy? That, yes. But what else? Well, what does he say in the next verse? This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who desires all mankind. It says that, again, it's the same construction, to be saved, all mankind to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. The man, King Jesus, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all mankind. That's the same reference all the way through, all mankind, all mankind, all mankind. The testimony given at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed as a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling you the truth and I'm not lying. A teacher of the true faith to the goyim, ta ethne. Remember, he doesn't see it as individuals, society as individuals. Yes, he sees individuals, he preaches the gospel to individuals, but it's Jewish people versus all the other peoples of the earth. And he says, I'm a teacher of the true faith to all the Gentile peoples. He desires the peoples to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
And then he desires for us to continue in steadfast faith. He says the just shall live by faith. Not only live to become renewed and born again, but then to live by faith. So the kingdom of God in his Christ has already come. It's now growing upon the earth. We've talked about Matthew 13. That's the leaven and the mustard seed. But Mark 4 says, when the seed comes into the ground, what does the farmer do? He plants it and he waits in faith. Uh, no, he pulls up the weeds and he, he keeps it watered if there's you know, a little bit of too, too little rain. But he waits in faith and God will bring the crop. Now, we proclaim and we trust God to bring the crop. And how do we know that? Well, until the totality of people groups are discipled and the totality of their culture is leavened with the yeast, realizing that it will not yet perfectly come until the second coming. This is what the theologians call the already but not yet. But they oftentimes meet, forget the middle part. Already growing, but are not yet perfect until the end. Now the growth isn't a straight line. If you look at the growth of the Christian community, it's like this. We're about right there now. It takes 2,000 years. It's, it's a, not a ge is it geometric or uh, exponential growth. So the not yet perfection and completion only comes at the end. Jesus must continue to reign. He says at 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28, this is we'll have to close because I'm way, way over. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to, no. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28. This is one of the most misunderstood and most trying to read their views into it. If you read it, what it says it gives you a long-term optimism. Okay, so he's talking about the resurrection. Verse 20, 15 verse 20. But Christ is indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. So remember, all of life came down to one good man, and he brought the power of the resurrection. Now, did Jesus raise people from the dead? Did Elisha? I think they threw a man into his grave and they came out and Elijah raised somebody. But did they die? Did Lazarus die? Yeah, we, we seem to be, yes, they died. Who will never die? Jesus. Who will never die who put their trust in him? John chapter 11. We. Even though we die, we'll never die, Jesus says. He's, he's enigmatic. And if you die, you will be raised again and you will never Fail to live. Yeah. No, he says, <clears throat> For since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through one man. First Adam, second Adam. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. If you're in Christ, that whole body will be raised up again on the last day. But each in his own turn. Christ is the first of the resurrection, the first fruits. Then, when he comes, those who belong to him, that's the rapture, when he comes, not three resurrections, one resurrection, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, all authority and all power. All authority and power has been given to him. But he says, now you go disciple them and your act of faith <clears throat> is bringing them under the lordship and the dominion of King Jesus' kingdom. All authority, dominion, and power is um, conquered by Jesus. He does it step by step. For he must be reigning, present active indicative in Greek, he must be reigning until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And what's the last enemy to be put under his feet? Death. He's destroying step by step by step by step. Don't give up. We are now in a down cycle in South Africa, but in the Muslim world, it's on a huge up cycle. 
Let it collapse. It's going to collapse around us. America is going to collapse. But we are the remnant. But we're not just the remnant, oh, we're the frozen chosen, some people say in America. <laughs> no, we're the, the power-filled light of the gospel. And then what's going to happen? The resurrection. He's will succeed. Don't give up. It changes your whole perspective. You can be an optimistic amillennialist or a neo-postmillennialist. And there's some things of the uh, premillennialist you can stand for. But in what the scripture teaches is long-term, realistic optimism. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy and your kindness that leads us to repentance. And we thank you, Father, that your word gives us long-term, realistic optimism. And Father, that we want to see the earth be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That's your promise. And we expect it to be fulfilled in your time as we step out in faith and live by faith. And we ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. <clears throat> now we're f 15 minutes over. Nancy, come on up. <clears throat>